a work-life balance is, is actually impossible. You cannot balance two things that can't be balanced. That's like, hey, let's balance an elephant and a feather. And like many mistakes that entrepreneurs make, you got to do stuff in order to realize you did it wrong. This company, this, this entity, this living, breathing thing is, is changing. It's growing up. It's, it's becoming something different. You've got to be yourself. I think you have, if you have the choice of implementing a thing because someone else found it successful or you have the choice of impl implementing something that you feel like really reflects you and what you're trying to accomplish, you cannot be afraid to be authentic. Welcome, I'm your host, Stefano, and this is When Leaders Talk, a podcast about leadership, and most importantly, about leaders. Harmony in life is something we all want to achieve, and it means balancing what is important for us, that is not just work, it can be family, it can be friends, it can be hobbies, or mental and physical health. And this is, has been the center of the conversation we had today with Virgil Virga. He's the president of Metronome. He's also his, uh, how we call himself, the chief pulsa. You can learn more during the conversation. We talk about his life, his failures, and what it means to have a successful business starting from scratch, and what is important for, for example, startup founders to move forward and achieve their vision, achieve their goals. So we also talk about the importance, of course, of self-awareness, the importance of not just balancing those important things in our life, but also to build resilience when things do not go in the way we wish. As always, there is a lot to unpack. I'm sure that Virgil will be a source of insights for everyone listening or watching this podcast. You can subscribe to this channel and so you can be updated on the new episodes that will be in. And also you can follow me on social media and contact me on masterurc.com if you want more information about coaching. Well, with no further ado, Virgil Berger. Virgil, what is your definition of good leadership? And I want to specify good because someone pointed out that leadership is too generic. So just to be sure we're on the same page. You sure? How about I conversely give you my definition of shitty leadership? <laughs> well, you know, you never know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, yeah, it's a great question. I'm glad that you added the descriptor of good there, right? Um, there's a... You know, I think that there is a spectrum of all things. When you can talk about sort of some divisive things, you know, usually some people, some people jump on one side and they jump on the other. As far as I see it, you know, quite frankly, I think that there really is a spectrum across almost everything. You know, they say there's gray area. There's nothing that's black and white. And I, I, I believe that wholeheartedly because it's hard for someone to sit and say, hey, I'm a great leader or, hey, I'm a shitty leader. Right. I think that we all exist on the leadership spectrum at, at different places on that spectrum at different places. And it all depends on how we're feeling, which side of the bed that we woke up on or how, you know, just simply how dedicated we are to being mindful of the dire need for good leadership. You know, so the, I think the definition for leadership is an individual who's willing to work on themselves and be mindful of the fact that there is a larger group of individuals that are looking to them for inspiration and guidance and ideas on how to execute. So it's a multifaceted. You know, right now on the leadership spectrum, I'm probably right around, um, I don't know, sort of like a green hue. 
So it's a tricky question. And quite frankly, you know, I'm always trying to learn more and look at other individuals of how they lead, seeing their confidence. It's a great topic. And hey, recently, I'll expound on that. You know, recently, we all have our ups and our downs, don't we? Sometimes I'm the best father, sometimes I'm not as good. Uh, and recently, I think that I could have been a better leader in a couple of situations. But it was important for me to look back and I've examined those situations. I've talked to my mentors about those situations and I've talked to peers about those situations. And looking deep down inside myself, realizing that those situations are always gonna pop up, but I've gotta center myself back again and realize that I have the capability to be very far on the spectrum of a good to a great leader if I'm really in the right mindset. So at times when I find myself sort of, you know, moving back down the effective leader spectrum, that's when I've got to realize, and that's when I've got to take ownership of what's going on. And then that's why I've got to do things like talk to my mentors, maybe read and listen to some podcasts, dig deep down, and then come out on the other side of that and really become that better leader again and the more motivated leader and someone who can really create at that point. It takes a lot, I guess, for admitting, you know, that you being not the best leader you could be in, in those moments. Um, and then that's what I, I appreciate from people like you who can actually admit that they that they're they're not perfect, you know, and uh, from time to time they do mistakes. And admitting those mistakes is is uh, is the first step because self awareness, as you were saying, you know, it's is really uh, the first part. Will you be open to share what happened in those moments? Or yeah, sure. So, oh man, which one? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so. You know, us as a company, as Metronome, we ran into a few, I would say, losses in a row, so to speak. And, you know, I've, I've learned in, over my career and, and really life, like not necessarily to take losses that hard. Uh, I'm really excited about the next one, quite frankly. That's what gets me on. That's always gotten me the most excited. Though being human, uh, there is, I would say there was a few that, you know, we lost and then maybe we lost one or two that maybe we really thought we should have won, or maybe there was, and, and then there was a process maybe we could execute it better as a company, right? So looking back at this, this wave of, uh, of things that could have happened in a different manner over the course of several months, you know, I said to myself, well, am I leading correctly? Because at the end of the day, it comes back to me. You know, I can talk to my folks and I can coach them up and we can get them new training. And regardless of the outcome of those things, it, it, it comes back to me, right? So I've got to be sure that, you know, I'm in the right place to put my folks in the right position uh, to lead. And I realize that, granted, still day to day and task to task, still excited and motivated and working with my team and pushing them. But there's a delta between, you know, the true Virgil is the leader and feeling every step of it and being in the moment and Virgil as still an effective leader and really having to be sure that I'm taking those steps because I'm in the process of becoming yet a better leader. Because, you know, you could argue perhaps that trajectory isn't like this. And perhaps what's happening is this. And at these moments, because I really like this, this could certainly feel like this. Me being an optimist, we'll say it's like this. Uh, so, you know, without mentioning specific things, we lost and we didn't execute correctly. And that comes back to me. How do we get to that next level? Learn from the things we did well, certainly the things that we could have done better, put some new um, executable processes or projects in place and 
move forward. Well, for those who are listening to the episode, when uh, Berger was describing these instead of these, he was describing like uh, more ups and downs. But uh, what, he, what he was describing was more like going up or plateau and then going up again, increasing and getting, you know, and improving. That's that's the, the thing that he likes. And uh, just to be clear for those who are not watching the video, but it's still an option. So thank, thank you for you, sharing. Well, I have to remember sharing. that people are just using the auditory part of their, you know, uh, imbibing process. All right, got it. I'll be much more visual from now on with my words. It, it, it's okay. It's okay. I, I understand. I know sometimes I, I guess I, I will do the same. So when you are your 100%, your 100%, when you feel like you're confident and strong, um, what is that you do you know, with, your, with your team? How do you behave? I would, I'm not sure that my team necessarily sees a huge difference in how I'm behaving. I'm sure they could potentially put their finger on maybe a thread or a fiber of something. Uh, I try to come to play every single day regardless of how I feel. So hopefully they don't see a huge difference. And hope, But I voice to them that, you know, I'm, uh, that I'm reading or improving. And I voice to them that... Hey guys, you know, these losses and this comes back on me and these are the things that I'm doing and this is how we're going to move forward and start executing and become better. So what I hear is a lot of being open, communication and transparency, you know. So you show up to your team, You, of course you try to be your best, uh, but we have our weaknesses sometimes and but you still go there the best you can and that's that's i think that's important for them right i mean i'm sure they do appreciate that and they feel like they feel you they see you um as a as a human being but is also not just as a leader you know not just as the infallible leader that doesn't exist by the way. yeah i think a lot goes along with that it, a lot of people have had this the, the saying you got to fake it to make it so to speak it, it, really around resilience you know, regardless of how I'm feeling that day, I've still got to push it and I've got to come and I've got to bring it because that's what I expect my team to do. You know, I talk, I talk here and there about we all care about each other and we do feel sympathetic to things that are going on in each one of our lives. The most important thing that's going on in each other's lives that we are most concerned with is what we're working on together. And unless you are friends, so to speak, outside of work and you're spending a lot of time outside of work, your relationship are your projects. Your relationship is your work and your relationship is the success of those products during work. So I think it's really important for everybody. I'd say especially a leader, but we're all leaders. We're all part of a team. We all got to bring it every day, regardless of if you know, something going on at the house, regardless if something's going on with my health, regardless of all those things, unless we're impaired, I think we've got to bring it. Now, should we be supported for those ancillary things by folks at work? Absolutely. You know, we all got hearts and, and we do work, love each other. Uh, I'm so grateful for the people that we've got here. We've all got to bring it. That's part of being a leader. It doesn't matter just doesn't matter you ever seen stripes that movie with bill murray it just doesn't matter it just doesn't matter <laughs> well you have a lot, of, a lot of energy i like that and actually this this was something that i appreciate even the first time we, we were able to talk and uh, uh also it seems like metronome is a company where it's fun to work in right i guess it's uh um uh, must might be must be interesting um dealing with a, a such, as, as you're describing, you know, a team of people who care for everyone else. Isn't, there is uh, beyond work, you know, it's something very important. As you, as you mentioned um, earlier, we do have our problems. It's not like we are not, um, it's not like the rest of our lives actually is always perfect. But we bring, sometimes we do bring out those problems at, at work. Um, so, and talking about the rest of our lives outside work, I know you have your vision 
your perspective on I'm gonna I'm gonna say something that probably you don't like much. I know that and what is so called balance between work and life. I don't know if you want to expand a little bit on this. I mean, we... Sure, I'm glad you brought this up. <laughs> on purpose, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yes, yeah, so I've got given a lot of thought to this. I've given a lot of thought to this from my own experience. I've given a lot of thought to this watching other people and the way that they sort of bring this to no pun intended life. So for me, a work-life balance is, is actually impossible. You cannot balance two things that can't be balanced. That's like, hey, let's balance an elephant and a feather. So your life, contains work your life contains your family and your life contains your hobbies and your life contains your health and you can go down the list of all the things that your life contains that are important to you for me to say that i need work-life balance and many times when this has been said to me or intimated to me by individuals the output of that means i want to work less now, does that mean that for everybody who says that? Absolutely not. Though, I think it could be conveyed better. I'm trying to find harmony in my life. I'm trying to find balance in life. You can't balance any of those things with life because life is perpetual. When you're sleeping, you're in life. When you're awake, you're in life. When you're at work, you're in life. When you're painting, you're in life. And when you're having fun with your kids, you're in life. What, how many of those things are included in every day of your life? I don't know. That's for you to figure out. I think it goes back to what we said before as well. Are you going to bring it every day? That's what I want to know. Are you going to be excited? Are you going to be resilient? Are you going to care about your projects? That's what I care about. That's what I care about for me too. Hopefully people see passion and when I'm bringing it, hopefully people see it in the products that I produce. So for me, I think it's up to you to find harmony in your life. It's not up to your coworkers to figure out how much you need to work. I think it's up to you to figure out how hard you're willing to work and how much you're going to bring it on those projects. I think it's up to you to figure out how you're going to raise your children. I think it's up to you to figure out if you even want a hobby. And if you do, are you going to do it at night when you're finished, when your kids go to sleep? When you're done cleaning the house and the dishes are already in the dishwasher and the dogs are fed and put outside and all the emails are answered i don't know that's up to you but it's not up to your co-workers and it's not up to your i don't think it's up to the company to figure out now are we here to help you like metronome we've implemented free um uh, mental health care that anybody can use across the entire company several hours a month because i do care about mental health and i do care about other people we're all in this for a better life for us, for each other, and for our families. And when I say this, I say life, sure, but I'm, we're sitting here talking about leadership. We're talking about, you know, um, a professional sort of executable life, right? So simply, you can't balance work and life. You have to work on yourself hard. And then if you're working on yourself and you feel like you've given all you can to your family, to your hobbies, or as much as you can, without going nuts, then that's putting yourself in a good place, you know? it's it, People have to take it on themselves. You have to. No one else is going to do it for you. It's not happening. And if that's what you're waiting for, it's going to be a long wait. Rumpelstiltskin type. I, first of all, how do you reach harmony? Like, how did you do if you do? How I'm sorry, you, repeat that. How, how do you reach this harmony in your life? Oh, I haven't. It's a great question. I wish somebody <laughs> would answer it for me. I've, I've, I've been trying. Listen, I, obviously, I'm, I'm joking around when I say that. It, it's, 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 I, but I'm not joking around to say that I've not reached harmony. If anybody, I don't know. Listen, if you're enlightened, God bless you. And I would love to, to hear how you've reached an enlightenment. I'm trying every day to get out of bed, to make sure my kids are happy and I've spent 
enough time with each one of them and I'm putting my wife's needs over mine that I'm doing as much as I can to make sure that Metronome is a fun place to work. The Metronome is a place that cares about its customers and works its ass off to execute on the projects as good or better than any of the other companies. There's all of those things are what I try to jam into my life and I try to reflect and I try to make them better the next day. Listen, Stefano, I go through lots of days where I feel like complete crap at, at several different times during the day because there's something weighing on me. I should be in the moment, right? I should be enjoying what's going on. And certainly I am because I get focused, but everybody's got those days. What's that magic thing that makes you wake up on some Mondays and you feel great, right? If you bottle that up, then you are enlightened and you have reached harmony. It's knowing that I'm not perfect, reading, getting some help when I need, fighting that voice in my head, the stories that we all create about if someone doesn't like us or I'm not good enough or I'm not a good leader or I'm an imposter. You know, it's, it's working against that person on that shoulder. It's helping people around me. It's, it's, it's a whole kit and caboodle full of, full of effort. That's what gets me going every day. It does. Well, you were talking, and actually I was wondering, uh, first of all, what is your definition of harmony then? What is that you want to reach, even if you haven't reached it yet? Well, I've got it. So in my life, I mentioned some things, and those are the things that are extremely important to me that I concentrate on. I've got my family, my three kids, my awesome wife, Jen, my two dogs that are out there in the office, and my three cats. One of them I don't really like that much. So I'm going to scribble that one out of my notes that I'm writing down right here, right? <laughs> and then I've got my hobbies. I love my hobbies. And it's, and it's sort of interesting. I think my hobbies is one of the places where I feel the least harmonized. I get a little down on myself because I'm not drawing enough. I get down on myself because I don't click on my guitar enough. So it's got my hobbies, and then I've got metronome, and then I've got my job inside of metronome. Those are two different things for me. Hmm. And then I've got an extremely important bucket of mine, which is health. I spend a lot of time reading. I spend a lot of time uh, researching uh, mental health and physical health. So if I take my hobbies and my family and my and Jen and I's company metronome and then my job inside metronome, my hobbies, those are the things that fill me up and make me happy. So for me, harmony means I feel like I've accomplished cool things across all of those. And you know, I'm gonna add this too. Um, I say I always use the word helping. I, I like helping people and and it's not like, you know, I'm helping somebody move or doing these unbelievably grand gestures. Because it'd be silly for me to think that out of all, with all those hobbies and my life, that, that, that I, honestly, that I am doing a lot of grand gestures all the time. But I do lots of really little good gestures. Those things are fun to me. You know, I love if someone, I'm in the parking lot and someone dropped their groceries, I will sprint across the parking lot to pick those groceries up for them and put them in their trunk. If I'm jogging, which I do a lot, if I'm running and someone is unloading, <laughs> this is fun, try it someday, and they're unloading their groceries in the street, like literally you're running and then you can stop and you help them put their groceries in their kitchen while you're running. And I don't even take my headphones off and stop listening to music. You know, so I think a lot of these little things, um, and I, I branch in these, they're, they're sort of in passing. Those things make me feel really good. You know, asking someone their name in the grocery store when you bump into them. Oh, hey, how you doing? Good, what's your name? Oh, Carol, what's up, Carol? Good to see you. Then you leave and you met, probably never see him again. That makes me feel really good. And that fills me up, I don't know, the bucket of giving or something. It's, it's, it's uh, work life. It's a farce, but life, that's what's real. So harmony is something that you will achieve later on in life. I would say it's like more a vision or um, something you will be working on for pretty much all your life. Yes, sir. I look forward to it.
Right. No, 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 I understand. And it's, it's, I, I wonder why you were, you know, making the list of all the things that are important to you, family, pets, work, hobbies, healthcare, you know, your, your self-care out of more than anything else. I wonder how many hours are in your day, <laughs> how many hours you, you sleep. Um, I appreciate you saying that. I'm going to add something to that. People often say, I would say most people say this who either are trying to sell me something or aren't appear to mind usually. And they say, oh, but you're so busy. Oh, you're busy. You're busy. You're busy. And I appreciate that. And I know they're just, that's something we say. I don't say that to people because what I, the, my theory is that everybody, we all know how many hours we have, right? There's 24 and everybody's doing something. You know, you can look at someone and say, oh, that person's lazy because they're watching television or something. Well, guess what? They're busy. If I ask them to do something at that moment, they're not going to because they're busy. So everybody's busy at every moment of their life. And I'm no busy. I literally am no busier than anybody else because I'm just going throughout my day and doing things every second and every minute and every hour. Nobody's busier than anybody else. What are the things you're fitting in that you think are important that are inching you towards a little more of a harmonic state? I don't know. I mean, listen, so there's plenty of people that sit around, watch TV and play video games that are happy as, as shit, you know? Are they busy? Yeah. Exactly. So, so they, they, and that's, that's the beauty of it, right? Because, right, so it's, it's basically... And ex exactly what I normally mean by uh, work-life balance. And but I understand your point. I think we're just giving a different name to the, to the same thing. There is no such a. It is not a perfect formula. It's not working less. It's just spending the time with the things that you care the most. It can be your family, your pets. It can be your hobbies. It can be playing guitar or listening to music. It can be working. You can work. I know people who are happy when they work 20 hours per day. I would never do that, <laughs> even if I'd done it. But man, who am I to judge those people? If you are happy working 20 hours per day and leaving nothing to anything else, well, that means you're happy. I mean, the most important part is probably when you feel you need to recharge, you take time off and you recharge and you manage yourself. I guess the problem is that many people don't know how to manage themselves. So it's work, 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 work. They put everything aside, then they are full of regrets, they'll burn out and they they need some some um, special treatment to recover. And that's, uh, I guess that's why now there is a lot of attention on healthcare, you know, and like mental care. And, you know, um, it's important to find those moments for, as I say, recharging your energies. So what is that you do normally when you feel really, I don't know if you ever feel, I mean, it looks like you have plenty of energy, but I guess at some, from, <laughs> some moment of your day or life, you do feel without energy, depleted. What do you do to recharge? What is the first thing you would do to recharge? So I will say that you're right. I have been blessed with a lot of, I guess, energy, you could say. I've never honestly felt like, oh, I'm tired or something, so to speak. I don't, I'm not really, I don't, of course I get tired at night, but in terms of just like during a day or something, I don't feel, I don't, but, but I will say this. For me, it's, it's more of a, it, it, I could catch something that you might refer to as being overwhelmed or a little bit of anxiety, maybe. Mm -hmm. That's what gets me. And, and it, I have to put a real definition on it, so to speak. And so what I do is, is I breathe. I take a moment and I sit, just like we both did at the beginning of this podcast. I appreciate that. And I give it as, as long as either I can or that I need. And that sort of gets me recentered. Just doing some breathing exercises is also, as I said earlier, is working on whatever story going on in my head, because usually that's a big part of it, is I've been telling myself something, something all day. And so if I can get that 
a little moved in the other direction and if I can breathe, then usually at least I can, you know, move forward and hopefully set my mind a little more and maybe forget about it after a little while. That's a little tact that I take. Right. I mean, what I do normally is either I go to music, either I play, I, mean, I don't play guitar well, so I really don't know, but I try to play something that will give me joy or I will listen to music. That's, that's, that's my trick. And I think it's important for everyone to have these kind of moments that really take us away from all those negative thoughts or moments or, you know, when we feel a little bit uh, without energy, empty, or running on fumes, and take our, our mind off and recharge and think about ourselves. Those are anchors that we always need in our life. And those anchors gonna, build resilience. I'm going to add to my answer there, Stefano. It's exercise. If there's any part of my day where I'm pretty much not thinking about anything else other than the task at hand for an entire hour. And that's when I'm exercising. Pushing as hard as I can, sweat flinging all over the gym, headphones on, music cranked up, kettlebells being tossed all over the place and pushing myself to as far as to complete exertion as possible. That, that works. It works. It's a way, along with breathing, mindfulness, hobbies, is a way to sharpen the soul every time. So even yes, if you sir. stop working, you can go back and work and do better. And do better. You can build resilience. Talking, talk, I want to go back to what you said earlier, you know, when you define leader we we're talking about self-awareness and i you know I, I i'm assuming from this conversation that you're a person that has spent a long time studying yourself you know, understanding yourself what is still the thing you're struggling with the most um, especially as a leader sure first thing that comes to mind is how do i phrase this is i don't take i don't take direction very well and i don't give it very well so when i say don't take direction very well i like the reason i think that i own a company is because i was never I produced good results, but I never really liked working for anybody. Sort of oil and water relationships, and that's on me. And it's not any on anybody else. Uh, now, I would also say that my I, I ask um, when I start tasking people, I'm I'm moving pretty quick sometimes, and I will task folks, and they will move out, and not necessarily be exactly sure. Uh, because I haven't necessarily delineated, delineated the entire task and we haven't agreed on a due date yet. Um, I sometimes when I'm moving fast, that could tend to happen. So I work on that a lot. I try to be sure that I'm in the moment, tasking correctly. We understand what task has been given. We've agreed on a due date and then we can move forward. But yeah, those are two things that I'm admittedly pretty bad about. Do you tend to micromanage sometimes? No, I don't. I'm, I'm the opposite of micromanaging. <laughs> I'm a giver and go do. Now, granted, there's some tasks that I really get excited about, and I will work right alongside with with my folks. And I, I mean, could I micromanage at times if I'm excited about the project and the outcome means a lot to me and I'm sort of involved? Then maybe I could, you know. More of a, that could be seen as a pet project, perhaps. I don't think I micromanage Stefano. Now, this could go into, am I as self-aware as I, I, I think I might be or I am not at times? If you ask people about how self-aware I was, they might say I'm a little less self-aware than I think I am. <laughs> yeah, that always happens. 
That, oh. that, that's normal, don't worry. So probably you should ask your, your people if you tend to micromanage from time to time. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll put a note here. Oh. <laughs> I don't wanna I don't wanna suggest anything. Of course, I'm, I was just asking because when you this say is you don't like I'm going to go into the comments and hold me accountable here, and I will let you know what the majority of my team said if I micromanage or not. I appreciate a lot. Um, and I think that don't liking to be controlled is something that we have in common, despite me having been 31 years in the Navy. But that was something I've been struggling with for, for a long time. And that the, the point is that I like to have control. That's why I was asking about micromanagement. I know that this is this was one of my flaws, you know, trying to always be there on the spot, controlling the process. And the, I've been working on this blind spot a lot, delegating more and really um, changing my expectation. No, it's not lowering or rising expectation. It's just understanding that I will do something in a way that is different from everyone else. So I don't have to expect someone to do the same thing in the same way. <laughs> that's, that's, they will they will reach a different, well, hopefully the same result because you give the result, you want to feel, you tell the people what they have to do. Just the way to do it can be can, can be completely different. And that's fine. It can take a little bit longer or shorter. It's still fine, right? That's, that's the most important part. There's a part about me that I've learned. Uh, growing up and making a lot of mistakes. I'm talking about mistakes. What is the, the failure, the greatest failure or mistake you have done and what have you learned from it? In my career or in my entire life? Well, let's stay in the leadership realm. So I will say in your career. All right, let's see. There's going to be some silence, folks. Well, it's a long list. It's okay, you can choose. <laughs> Great. You know, I, I think a mistake that I made, and like many mistakes that entrepreneurs make, you got to do stuff in order to realize you did it wrong. So I'm making a caveat. I think we all, as entrepreneurs, doing things the first or doing anything the first time, right? You're, you're going to learn by screwing up. I assumed that most of the people, so we've been around now for, I think it's about 12 years, give or take, 12, 13 years. And I want to say for about, geez, four or five years, I think our turnover was at about 98%. We never lost anybody. Nobody left. No one got let go. And, you know, and then, you know, now we've been around for another seven years after that. And we've had, you know, our team has, has changed and morphed many different ways since then. And I was under this, you know, this naive impression that my, my team that I had then was going to get me to where I was going to be two years from then or four years from then or where I am now. And that's just absolutely not the case. And, you know, I think for young, for me as the young entrepreneur that I was, it gave me a sense of pride that the same team that I had was still there. The naivety was knowing that for us to, as a company, to mature and become something different, so did the team. You know, it's not necessarily, we know that we can all learn and get better. But we all know that we have shortcomings. I don't not shortcomings, but we all we all learn different things at different paces. And quite frankly, there's some things that none of us ever have any interest whatsoever in learning. And some of those new skills and new processes have to be brought in by new people. And some of the old things that we did may continue doing, but some of those things won't. And that's okay. And I think the big step in my career and in an entrepreneur's career is understanding that that's not a knock on the uh, the ex-teammate or the teammate or or the company or you all it means is that this company this this entity this living breathing thing is is changing it's growing up it's, it's becoming something different and in order for that thing 
that you care about that you that you all love some people are are, are going to move on and do better things in other places some people are going to learn new skills and some other people are going to come in the one thing that remains constant is that it remains what it is which is that company that entity that is getting better that's changing that's growing so to encapsulate what i just said is that the mistake i made was that i believe I hung on to a team and a notion that I thought was gonna get us somewhere. And it took a while to sort of hit one of those plateaus, so to speak, before we realized that things needed to change. And it takes courage, right? To change things at some point, especially if you have a, a young startup, a new startup. So you, you deal with startups, you do, you do marketing. So I guess you, you know a lot of people working in startups. What do you think is the biggest mistake they normally do? Why so many startups fail? I can't say why they fail. Everybody fails for different reasons, right? But I will say that I do get asked a lot, you know, well, hey, I'm gonna start this business, what should I do? Like, well, I asked that same thing to my, my mentor, which was my brother. And he said, well, you write a business plan. And cause he said, if you're not, if you don't have a plan, you're planning to fail. And he walked, he walked into his office and he pulled up his old business plan and then he printed it for me, he handed it to me and he said, here, it'll give you some ideas. And that was it. And I went and wrote a business plan. So, I, you know, I, I, even if it's not, even if you don't execute on the whole darn thing, at least you sat down, you've taken the time, you've ideated through things, you've changed some stuff. I think it's extremely important. And that's the first thing I say to everybody, you write a business plan. It doesn't have to be a hundred pages long. Maybe it does. I don't know. And they say, well, where would I get a business plan? I'm like, well, I Googled it and there was uh, some templates and that's what I used. I think it's important and period. That's a big mistake everybody makes. They just get going. And when I say that, I assume they're asking me because they look at Metronome and maybe me and my team and they, and they find that redeeming and cool and they wanna have something like that. We wrote a business plan. Many times those people don't write business plans after they asked me how I do that. Interesting, isn't it? Well, it, it is also because a business plan is your strategy, you know, is how you wanna develop your company. So even if you have the best product, you need to have a strategy to, to, to get there. Even if you have a vision, you need a strategy to get there. Otherwise, and also you need to be ready. Let me add that you need to be ready to pivot, to change at some point because, you know, things might be different from what you expect. Um, and this leads us to the last question. Then. That is, what is the suggestion you would give to a young leader other than, you know, having a business plan, I guess, what is the suggestion we give a young leader coming to you asking for a few recommendations to be, a successful leader. This is so, um, sounds like a corny, cor um, canned up answer, but it's so true. You gotta be yourself. I think you have, if you have a, the choice of implementing a thing because someone else found it successful, or you have the choice of impl implementing something that you feel like really reflects you and what you're trying to accomplish. You cannot be afraid to be authentic. You can't. I know it's easy. It's easier for me. I get this. It's that I I understand that that's easier for me to say. Thirteen years later, I get it. I also know that there was times earlier in my career where I wasn't necessarily being authentic and people called me out on it. And thank God. 
because those are some early moments in my career where I was very self-reflective. Not everybody likes me. Hey, newsflash. Not everybody's going to like anybody. Some people are going to like some people. Not everybody's going to like everybody. And knowing that, I think that gives me the strength to just be myself and to be authentic. It's not going to work with everybody. And I wish it would, because it'd be neat to have connections with everybody. But if you are authentic, then at least people are going to respect you if they don't like you. And the people that do, that, that are drawn to that, are never going to leave. As long as you're still being authentic. I, I got this little story where we started out in the basement of our Ashburn, Virginia townhouse. And uh, I hired our, my first recruiter while we were still in the house, Mary Hastings. And so she came every day and she sat in my basement and made recruiting calls all day. And in my basement, it was uh, decorated like this, actually. All my, I have hundreds and hundreds of concert posters I've collected over the years. I get many of them framed and they're hung in my office at home. They're hung in my offices at, at Metronome. And, and when we were in the basement there, we had not opened an office yet. And we were, we were just about to get a, our first office. And, and Mary says to me, and she's like, oh, we're going to hang all these music posters in the office, right? And, and, I, and I had thought about that a little bit before, but I was very nervous to do so because back then, this was the, you know 2010, I think, 2009. She, um, most of the offices in our industry that you went into, white walls, and just like they really tried to make it look like America. And Stefano, I am a patriot. I love America. Stand up and sing the national anthem every day by myself. Um, but that doesn't reflect me. I'm not an agency in the United States. I'm a company. I'm a private company. So luckily in that second, I didn't give it a thought, even though it made me very nervous. I said, yes. And it was the best decision that I ever made because everybody has ever come through our office. You know, listen, aesthetics are one thing. I get it, right? It really matters how you feel. But people wear certain clothes because it makes them feel a certain way. It helps them be authentic, right? You cut your hair a certain way because that makes you feel like you, you get to be authentic. You know, we now, the offices and the people in them, I make sure to say all the time, I want you to be you. One of our, uh, we have a, a triad, our mantra at Metronome is to be valuable, is to be dependable, and very importantly, to be inimitable. And that means to bring a little bit extra, to have a little bit of flair, a little bit of flash. People are going to remember you for your results. I get it. But they're also going to remember you for the way you made them feel. So being authentic and trying as hard as you can to bring as much of you and your life that radiates normally into the, the company, I think could, you know, or in, into your endeavors makes a big difference. Well, thank you for that. I, I think you say a lot of beautiful things. I'm taking a lot away from this conversation. You know, I guess the self-awareness part is probably one of the things I would agree upon, uh, the most. But also the concept of harmony in life um, is, I think, I think I see your point when you say that uh, the, the, the balance work life is, uh, is a myth. It's not something that you can achieve. Um, so thank you for having been with us and for sharing your perspective on leadership. It has been an amazing journey. And also I appreciate, first of all, I like your office. I must say that. <laughs> I like the posters and all the colors. I like blue, as you can see. Um, and uh, I love your energy. That what that is something that I I can appreciate. I, I appreciate the first time we met. And I liked that a lot. So thank you again for having been with us. Thank you so much, Stefano. It was a pleasure. Uh, excellent questions. I appreciate you giving me the time to pontificate and give you very long answers to your questions. And it was a lot of fun. And I look forward to putting in the comments that. I don't micromanage. <laughs> that's that's going to be hard for them to answer in a different way. Now. <laughs> Thank you again. Take care, Stefan. I appreciate it.